Hey Ding Dongs, I'm Jamie. I'm Richard. And this is Explain It to Jamie, the political comedy podcast in which I, Jamie, a politically innocent but curious young man, have the complicated political happenings of the world explained to me by my political savvy friend Richard Lamb. But today, it's not just going to be me explaining things because we're very, very excited to welcome two extremely special guests to the show. We have... Mr. Anthony McMahon and Mr. Thomas McKechnie. Hello, guys. Hey, how you doing? Hello. Um, you want to say well, your name in your voice so that the audience yes. can can get that? I'd rather not. Actually, I'd, I'd rather not be identified. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> sure thing, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm very happy to be identified. Uh, let's begin the class war now. Uh, yeah. I'm Thomas. <laughs> yeah. Um, Anthony and Thomas are very special friends of the show because they are. If you've been a listener for a long time, you'll know that we've mentioned them many times because they are kind of like our de facto fact checkers slash research team. They're the guys who I always run things by before I say them on the podcast. They send me sources sometimes, and often they're the guys who say, hey, dumbass, you got this wrong. Um, I, I, Anthony, also, we have this kind of running bit about how handsome Anthony is and how nice his eyes are. Yeah. We actually have kind of an embarrassing uh, fact to correct this yeah. week. This episode is going to double as a very uh, a slight double dip. Yeah. Uh, we would like to double dip our opinion on Anthony's eyes. It turns out Anthony's eyes are not crystal clear blue pools of mountain water. Yeah, as we have oft described in various forms of metaphor. They are, in fact, green. green. <laughs> They're green. <laughs> and it was Anthony, who has listened to every episode of the podcast, I believe, was too nice to say it to me himself. It was only when his girlfriend started listening to the podcast that she texted me to tell me his eyes were green. That, or we have actually unearthed a deep uh, a psychological self uh, a wish for himself that he had blue eyes and he just enjoyed hearing about it. Yeah. Anthony, can you comment? Yeah, I think my <laughs> eyes are um, green like the uh, the rolling fields of Ireland. Yeah. But I think you've identified them as blue like, um, I, I don't know, uh, the, the Saint, Saint whatever his name is, Cross in uh, Great Britain. Uh, Saint... Mike. So you're saying Same you're, Mike. you're a loyalist. I, yeah, like. I, think I think you're trying to out me as a loyalist. And yeah. uh, when we do explain it to Jamie, um, yeah. the Irish conflict. Yeah, the troubles. Uh, I'll, get, I'll get much more offended and I'll put on an accent. But for now, I'll just let it slide. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thomas, any physical parts of your body you want to clarify for us right now? Um, no, I feel I have had no specific um, <laughs> maligned... Uh, no parts of my body have been maligned on the show. And so if I am merely a mysterious... Uh, angry voice in the void. Uh, I'm totally okay with that. As you have been all along to us. Great. Okay. Well, that concludes this double dip episode. <laughs> <laughs> On to the normal episode. Um, so, Jamie, what do you want to learn about this week? I want to learn about, guys, are you ready for it? Communism. <gasps> That's right. <laughs> pretty general, pretty big. Pretty big, big, big idea, I think. But I, I don't know that I have got a fair shake on on what it is exactly, mm -hmm. and also how it's relevant now. I feel like in in school, I got to very, you know, this is what Russia is, this is what China is, and this is what communism is as it pertains to both those places. But I don't know that I actually got a. This is what Canadian communism is, or what mm -hmm. uh, you know, general Western communism is. Sweet. Well, I feel like we'll all be happy to share equally in explaining to you what communism is. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that it's gotten like a weird rap, especially for our generation. We're kind of like the very, very tip of the people who grew up without a major communist, like West versus East communist, like conflict on. Um, obviously, China is still technically a communist country, but yeah, Thomas is making like a, a gross lemon face right now. So, <laughs> so like it's true. They're really not a communist country. They're a fucking capitalist country that also like takes shit from its poor people. So, you know, they're, they're not really a communist country anymore. And so because of that, finally, in our generation, in our adulthood, communism is becoming a lot less of a dirty word in the West and people are starting I mean, you know, communists never left the West, but people are starting to look at actually what the ideas are in a new way and think to themselves, wait a minute, this kind of could solve a shitload of the problems we're having. So I think it's resurging right now. We see that in America. We'll get into all this. We see it in America. We see it in other places. And let's get into what is it exactly and what is it not. Okay, let me just... Slide on my political water wings as we <laughs> dive into the conversation of communism. You re ready, fellas? I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Hold I'm hands. Two, I'm ready. Three. <laughs> Whoa! Boy, 
boy, oh boy. It's a good thing that the theme song was there to catch our fall, for communism was not a, a pool ready to accept us, but just my hardwood floor no. in my bedroom. No, I'm paralyzed now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't I can't walk anymore. Yeah. What do you guys think of the theme song? It's a great theme I song. I fucking love your theme song. I especially, <laughs> I especially liked dancing around to it in my uh, red Speedo. I was also ready to swim in the pool of communism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I have to shout out that my girlfriend Jade is the voice on the theme song. Her and her two friends, her friends Kathleen and Emma. And Jade every time is like, why don't you ever credit me as being, <laughs> being the voice of explaining to Jamie? So and now you have it, is. Jade. He has both credited you as well as addressed the fact that you wanted to be credited. For <laughs> <laughs> Love you, dear. It's a compliment and a shame the way that can only happen in relationships. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. right. That's right. You've heard it here first, folks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jamie. Yes. What do you know about communism? Mr. McCarthy, I... I don't know anything about communism. I don't know well, why I'm here. Well, no, we're all friends here. <laughs> Just go on. Feel like you can really unpack. No, no, Mr. McCarthy, I feel uncomfortable. I, I don't know that I should. Listen, you <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> you fucking queer communist bastard. You're going to jail. Have you no decency, sir? <laughs> have you no de After all of this, have you no decency? Joe McCarthy sounded like... Like Grover, Grover. <laughs> right? Is that actually what he sounded like? No, I don't know what okay. he sounded like. Was like no, that was a God. bit I was doing. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Also, I don't believe he would be queer if you were a communist, but Joe McCarthy definitely would have Probably called somebody that. Yeah. Probably yeah. would have. Probably would Just look it up. Yeah, I, you know, I guess I know what I what I learned in junior high, as, as I sort of mentioned, as it's associated with China, as it's associated with Russia. Communism is sharing, right? It's like an, an idea. It's the mm -hmm. idea of shared work and and labor and ownership of uh, the companies that you work for mm -hmm. i think i that, that's what i think it is and now go <laughs> activate you three yeah i mean like <laughs> that's not wrong right like that's at, at its core that's like not a bad way to look at it at its core i mean there's all kinds of ways to get into communism also i mean like let me throw out the caveat right away i am not a an expert on communism. There are experts on communism. There are people who have like the most intensely well, like knowledgeable, like their facts are impeccable. Their dates are impeccable. They're they're They know every corner of the theory and they, t they're communists who are much like more well-read communists than I am. Mm. Right. So like, um, so I'm not one of those people. I'm going to get shit wrong. Please don't write me angrily, angrily on Twitter if I don't know which of Lenin's toenails was shaped like what, you know, Baltic state or whatever. Like, <laughs> I know there are you guys out there who know that, and I respect you, but that's just not what I'm bringing to this. We're going to just try to explain the gist of it, I think, tonight. So, yeah. Second middle toe look like Estonia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, obviously, uh, I am not now, nor have I ever been a member of the Communist Party. No, but, but no. Um, absolutely. There's a ton of theory around it. There's entire schools of thought dedicated to it. The, famously, the Frankfurt School was mm -hmm. one. Uh, there was even some counterculture in the Chicago School, uh, the University of Chicago, the birthplace of kind of neoliberal economics that runs the world right now. There's a big countercurrent there and a counterculture in places like Oberlin and uh, in Harvard and in uh, CUNY and the State University of New York that mm. really kind of tried to think about the world in a great way and tried to think about the world in a collective way yeah. um, that uh, I have not done yet. But yeah. uh, I, I've read a handful of them. Uh, you know, I, I've read communism for the articles, I think, is what I'm <laughs> yeah. trying to say. Yeah. And communism insp uh, uh, inspires among the left, like, a lot of deba internal debate about what exactly it is and what it should look like because it's never been realized in the form that it was originally conceived yet. People have made the attempt, but it's never gotten across the finish line fully and maybe never will. You know, it's a... Uh, it's an interesting thing. Why don't we just start explaining it immediately? So, yeah. like, so where did it? Let, maybe we should start. Where did it start? Where? Like, right. How did it? Yeah, get traction at all in the first place. Okay. So, who was involved? Um. So, communism was first articulated by a dude named. Karl, Karl Marx. Marx. Yes. Nailed it. Go. Thank you, Mrs. Antonello. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she taught me that in grade eight. Yeah, that's right. He was the dude 
among other achievements of his are inventing glasses with a nose and mustache attached to them mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> creating the letter grading system on report cards right. oh, and, uh, oh, <laughs> and uh, being half of the team that founded Marks and Spencer, the popular clothing company. Oh. He was a busy dude. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was actually a fantastic capitalist. He, yeah. ran, <laughs> he ran a great British department yeah, store. Yeah, he was like the L. Ron Hubbard of like the mid-19th century. Um, no, uh, so Karl Marx was a was a German philosopher um, who kind of uh, lived in Britain. And in Britain, in the middle of the 19th century... Wow, okay. I just want to say, right away, you've blown my mind. <laughs> I thought Karl Marx was Russian. Oh! Yeah. No, yeah. interesting. No, as, actually, as, a, as an interesting thing, a part of... Um, Oh, God, we've already hit the Hitler part of this conversation. <laughs> uh, a big part of Hitler's push against communism was that Marx was a German Jew. Um, and they're like, there is an inextricable link, link between German Jewry and communism. Oh and so God. there was that, that was part of the pushback against communism in uh, the rise of fascism in Germany. Okay. And Vladimir Lenin was a, is a Russian. He's a Russian, yeah. and he's yeah. the he picked up sort of where Karl Marx left off. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, and and okay. was directly influenced by Marx. Although I believe generationally, Lenin did not ever really meet Marx. He came just after Marx. Yeah. So Karl Marx wrote, "Oh God, what's the year? 1868?" Uh, question mark. 1848. I think. 48. The, the Communist Manifesto. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So Karl Marx was writing in the mid 19th century in Britain, and in Britain he was witnessing the beginning of the industrial revolution firsthand right and it was and by when, as he saw you know all of these massive factories being built these new revolutions in like coal power and um, hydraulics and machines being able to like produce uh, goods on this massive scale he witnessed also the societal changes that were coming along with that people relocating from uh, the country into the cities, the conditions they were forced into the cities. Like you're a dude who knows your Dickens. Like you, um, and that's obviously the late 19th century. But like, you know, people in horrible poverty, child labor, the no regulations on how long you were supposed to work, mm -hmm. no regula no holidays, no weekends. Not that, that stuff. all came later, right? At the beginning, it was unvarnished capitalism, right. right? And a very select few people were getting extremely rich off of these people who began toiling in misery in industrialization. Um, and Marx was seeing all this happening, and I think... I mean, and again, we're already into the territory where I'm extrapolating, and I don't, I, I don't know exactly. But there was, um, I think, he just saw the immorality immediately of capitalism. He saw the immorality of these few people getting rich off of all of these poor people toiling in these factories for them, right? The people who own the factories would get rich, and the people who who worked in the factories would get shit all. And I think it was in exploring the morality of that that he created the kind of ideological foundation for what became known as communism and huh. what he called communism also within that um one of the big things that that marx touches on and one of the places where even if you're not even if you believe that the free market is the solution to all the world's problems um that he did one concept that is sort of just like irrefutably useful for maneuvering the world is his concept of historical materialism which is the idea that anything that is happening in the world has a basis in what happened previously in the world huh. that like history that we are constantly living in the results of history and so like his background in history and philosophy um paired with the very lived experience that richard was talking that's about right. that's is where right. these theories came from because it wasn't it, like he could no longer plug into like old christian ideas of like oh the poor are poor because god hates them right like right. he was starting to look at the world through as a as series a of causes yeah. and effects yeah and he right. was the first guy who popularized the idea that people's economic circumstances determined like huge things about their behavior their health like basically a, in his mind your the way you exist economically in the world as an economic unit essentially determined everything about your status in the world how you could rise what your life was like right he was the first guy to make that link mm. in, the, in the mid 19th century wow um so he was like you know social science was created in the mid 19th century he was one of the first practitioners of it in a lot of ways and then also so Foundationally, we've talked about this in our Universal Basic Income episode, which you should listen to, but what he kind of zoomed in on, or like, I mean, he zoomed in on many things. He has a very large body of work, like it's, and it's very dense and crazy, because he's a, he's a philosopher, he's a 19th century philosopher more than he's a 21st century economist, you know? Like, it's tempting to think of him like 
as the kind of economist you'd read in the paper or something. He's not like that. He's a lot more of a dreamer. He's a lot more like Nietzsche than he is like Paul Krugman, who writes for the New York Times, right? right. He's like pretty fanciful, and he's not afraid to like dream mm-hmm. of right. a better world. As I understand, <clears throat> communism is like a search for utopia. In, That's right. Way, right? He and, which is an utopia. ideal. That's right. right. Yeah. And... And I don't know that I, you know, I, I, I think ideals are lovely, but I also think they, you know, realism gets in the way of that a lot. And yeah. Well, kind of interesting on that point. There was a we can say that socialism began with Karl Marx, but um, there was a great kind of history of social ideas that kind of came out of around the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. There were writers like uh, well, even Saint Thomas More wrote a book called Utopia, and it was about a great land where people didn't have to work as hard and everyone shared in the bounty of this in- incredible land. And then these. 18th century French philosophers like uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon started coming up with these ideas about how everyone could share equally. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. Marx's great innovation, communism, was that this was actually what he called scientific socialism. So that in applying the principles of economics, the principles of moral philosophy, and the principles of uh, econo- like economics, moral philosophy, and government, you could combine them and create a path towards a utopia, uh, which was the thing that differed him from um, like the Fourier and Proudhon and these kind of 18th century French utopians who just dreamed and wrote poetry all day. Right now, let's let's already let's just right now take a sidebar and say socialism is like ideologies is like an umbrella term for ideologies that involve sharing resources and communism is a kind of socialism so like socialism is the larger term right communism fits into that you hear them kind of interchangeably used sometimes right like socialist versus communist they do have like technical de- am i wrong yeah, my, about no, that my, my understanding of it is that um uh socialism is based on the state uh, on state control so the state owns the state ergo the people owns everything and profits from that ownership and like utilizes uh, right. all of those means. Um, this sort of shared ownership over everything allows people um, greater and greater freedom and greater and greater control over their own lives, mm-hmm. which uh, only grows exponentially um, because people, once sort of liberated from the material conditions of their existence, are able to take control of their own lives, able to say, like, no, I don't want this to be organized like this, or no, we shouldn't be building these kind of things, or no, um, or yes, we should be doing this, and mm-hmm. that this uh, slowly dissolves the government's need to interve- intervene and sort of like set things up and make things happen for people, and the people then sort of can do these things for themselves until eventually the state disappears, mm. and people in a sort of a small, right. on a, on like in small self-regulating communities organize their own existence, uh, once it, but, you know, for the mutual benefit of everyone, with everyone having uh, an equal say in the operation of it. Okay. So communism is like the end point mm-hmm. of the I, socialism. And, okay, and, and uh, Mrs. Antonello, you know, <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to test what you taught me. I, I remember um, her talking about the political spectrum. You know, she was saying, we, o- we often say left and right, mm-hmm. um, but actually it's not, if you don't, you shouldn't look at it as a line, a clear line. You should look at it as a, an incomplete circle. So that as you go further left on the spectrum, you get to eventually to socialism. Uh, uh, and as you go further right on the spectrum, you get eventually get to communism. But actually socialism and communism uh, sit right next to each other, uh, but not aren't connected. Correct, Antonello. Guys, how do you feel? I've heard about that as the, the horseshoe theory a lot. Uh, yeah. Rather than socialism and communism, it's uh, fascism and communism. Yeah. Right. And that was something that was espoused a lot, I think, in the 1940s by uh, a lot of American liberals who believed that the American way was the correct way, the German way was incorrect, the USSR was incorrect. We're right in the golden middle. Uh, and and they philosoph- were right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I will add, for Mrs. Antonella's benefit, it is very possible that she did say fascism and communism, and I'm only remembering through my own bias socialism <laughs> yeah. and communism. What, you mean you don't remember every single thing you learned in middle school, Jamie? I remember barely what I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> who are you guys? Why, where are we right now? Yeah, oh, I'm trying to remember anything I learned in middle school right now. 
I remember uh, I had a, a teacher teach us about the French Revolution, and he was a Polish man named uh, Mr. Mirza, mm. and uh, everything he described to us was in a nutshell. And he ended every <laughs> sentence over the course of an entire semester talking about the French Revolution with, in a nutshell, Robespierre did this. In a nutshell, <laughs> Napoleon then did this. And he would go on an entire class and say, in a nutshell, 45 times. That was a very, very prolific nutshell that he he and everyone else lived in. He had a whole orchard of yeah. nuts. <laughs> <laughs> in middle school, I learned that I was a queer <laughs> I think we all Go learned that, that day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. Good times. <laughs> okay, guys, I wish we'd go back to middle school. Not, not, <laughs> never, um, ever, ever no. would I. Okay, so let me zoom all the way back for a second. Mm -hmm. So Karl Marx, we talked about this in our Universal Basic Income episode. Uh, one of the things he talks about is how one of the things he came to believe is that doing labor is a fundamentally human thing. When you um, perform an activity, when you do labor, when you make a shelter, when you hunt an, an animal and cook it, when you pick food, pick berries and eat them, there's like something very just the fundamental essence of humanity is like doing tasks to sustain yourself and for your own pleasure and your own enjoyment and your own survival. There's like something right about that. And when you're in a capitalist system where you're working for a wage, um, part of the problem the thing that happens is that you are performing labor and you're being compensated with a wage but your wage is always less than what your labor is worth right because there has to be some surplus left over for somebody to profit from your from your labor right the right? company needs to make money exactly and because the company is making money a certain amount of your like human labor is just bleeding away from you all the time mm -hmm. and and you become what Mar Marx used the word alienated he's like he says you become alienated from your in the translation I read it was like species being it's like your that's like your soul like that's really what he's kind of talking about but soul had a you know super religious connotation mm -hmm. that it has sort of lost a little bit in our modern age. Mm. Um, you lose some part of your fundamental humanity when you when you don't enjoy your own labor. And I think I would I would expand on enjoy not just like in, like you don't have right. to enjoy being a coal miner, but if you if everything that you do as a coal mm -hmm. miner uh, that all of that profit goes to you if you are compensated for everything that you do, then you enjoy the fruits of your if, labor. If, if right. you're like if you build if you spend weeks on your spare time building of like a fence for your house, when you're done the fence, that's your fence. Right. And it's like even if it's fucking hard ass work, it's satisfying. And there's something like fundamentally human about creating things and producing things and doing tasks and doing labor. Mm. But if you're like a contractor for a huge like construction company and you're just driving around building fences for whoever you're just like mindlessly building fences you don't get to enjoy the fences you're being paid a wage the fences mean nothing anymore and suddenly you're spending all of your time doing all of this labor uh -huh. and it's and you're not you're not profiting from it in your in a spiritual way like that's what he kind of comes down to with Marx okay there's like a it's a philosophy thing you know it's not a economic thing at this point um, ah, so I, I, well, I was gonna say, uh, although now I feel like I, need, I I should rescind right away. But I think I think like um, so effectively, mm -hmm. if the if the wage justifies the work, but but we're not no. talking about economics. Is what you're saying? There's no wage. If you're getting paid a wage, you can never get a wage that's fair. Because if somebody's profiting, that means the the actual value of your work, you're always making less than it. The best way I've ever had this explained is mm -hmm. at a certain point in every workday, mm. you start working for free. Right. That like you like if if the company wants to make two hundred dollars off of you right. and you get paid a hundred dollars, halfway through your day, you're working for free. Right, 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 right. So yeah, okay, okay, I understand that. Right. And as ah. long as that's the case, on some level you're aware of that. Right. Now there are companies that offer uh, I mean you have to these are specialized jobs usually now but there are companies that offer stock options for your for your wage. Does that fall into your th this web of like if you're you know you are making a wage which is less than what your work is worth but as, but also on a yearly basis you're be being given options to buy into the company that you yourself are working for so you are benefiting directly from your work. Does that is that does that fall into this 
I think it maybe does, but I th- in any company that's obviously making a profit in a capitalist market, the way Marx would conceive of it, you're never getting a stock option that's worth your actual share uh-huh. of the company, right? Right, right. You know, that's right. You're getting maybe uh, 5,000 stock or something like that that you can buy out at a certain mm-hmm. amount, but there's still 100,000 or 200,000 shares of the company floating around for shareholders to make a profit off of the workers. See, yeah, I and you're not, you don't have a, uh, a share of the company that is proportionate to the labor you perform to, for the company, mm. right? You, it's very unlikely that you have that. But if, to make a really quick jump from what you're proposing to communism, yeah, if you have a 20th of, a, a, like tw- tw- one 20th of the shares of a 20-person company. Like then if you're, you're in communism. Own, that's, that's communism. Right. Like, yeah. you just have, <laughs> like, like, that's communism. Like, you know, your percentage of the company is okay. yours. And then you're like, yeah, then 100%. Then you are working with a group of people for everyone's benefit, and yeah. you derive, like, an equals percentage of that benefit. Yeah, and that's, let's, right. let's go into so that. So most, like, Silicon Valley startups start as communist. Yeah, the three dudes at the table who agree to split everything. But you know what? Even in those cases, often there's disproportionate splits right and maybe if everyone agrees that that's fair to the proportion of labor at those moments those guys are are in the communist ideal for like a little bubble Mm. right obviously they still exist and they're inside a deeply non-communist world so there's no there's like there's a kind of a like a meme phrase buzzword that's like there's no ethical consumption under capitalism right you can't ever be like oh i bought this thing and this is like good this is a good thing i bought and it's like there's no oppression in this thing at all um but uh but yeah like for in those in that moment those people are the pro- i mean the problem with the silicon valley model then is that like the whole point of those companies is that they're they're trying to get bought right, right. <laughs> like they're like and yeah. at that point they become and then they hire people for salaries and for wages and stuff like that and at that point those they are they become the the capital the capitalist class. They become the the kind of right. bourgeois. Was that, that the petit bourgeois? Is yeah. the bourgeois the yeah. bourgeoisie right? Which is a word that you've probably also heard associated with communism. Yeah, yeah. So Marx zoomed in on this middle class who's not like like the bourgeoisie, like the upper class, the people who profit from all of these. You know, from, from the people who own factories, the people who who profit from other people's labor as like the problem, and. Um, Again, I'm you know this is the like Cole's notes explanation, but basically said that those people needed to not exist anymore, <laughs> like for, for and and Marx's only solution that he could understand was revolution. Now remember, he's writing fifty years after the French Revolution, revolution. so revolution is like in the air. You know, people, it, it's. Every nation in Europe was terrified of revolution. It's a real possibility. It is a super real possibility. Yeah. It is like very much a thing that could happen anywhere. Right. And what's interesting about the revolutionary thing to me (laughs) is that um, Marx thought communism was definitely going to start in in Britain. Yes. And then spread to Germany and then some other places in Europe and eventually to Russia. Because Russia was too culturally backwards in Marx's view. That like they were were still serfs. They were like... um, uh, they're not still serfs. They were only recently emancipated yeah, serfs yeah, at that point. The czar and people giving mountains for princes' birthdays and right? stuff like that. Like, yeah. there was no way that they could sort of organize themselves into an effective socialist government. So mm-hmm. that's really the interesting part of, the, like, that's part of of how of what shaped the idea, the sort of modern idea of, of communism and, and of socialism is this place that Marx thought could never be, so could, could never arrive at socialism first, became the first one to try it. That's right. Mm. And so what's interesting about that is that when Marx was writing these books... Um, uh, Russia was actually still a feudal society when he first started, when he and Engels first started, and Western Europe was a capitalist society. And Marx thought that capitalism was amazing, right? In that it was the first ever system to strip morality out of economic systems, because feudal societies and slave societies, which he talked about, were actively immoral ways of conceiving the world right Ah. you either conceive that some people like he talked about how um the slave trade was taking black people and ridding them of their humanness or the serf society was saying that serfs were less human than their lords whereas capitalism said that everyone is human and he thought that communism was the next step beyond capitalism and so only a capitalist economy could become a communist economy because communism was saying everyone's human and we have to activate that and we have to make it so that people are actually equal, not just theoretically equal. That's right. Mm. Yeah, capitalism. I mean, and and you see this all over the history of 
the West now. Like, capitalism is a an unstable equation, right? It, it it has all of these core beliefs that are not followed through on in society, and those have always been like the problems. You know what I mean? Like when America split off from Britain and wrote into its Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, all of a sudden they had a problem. They instantly had a fucking problem, right, in their country. And it, it was an unstable equation that needed to resolve itself, and it continues to resolve, be unresolved to this day. You mm. know, like the slavery thing. Yeah. Like the fact that they were a country that said, you know what, our founding principle is that everyone's created equal, and then they also had slaves in their country. The instant the ink was dry on that thing, they were in trouble. And they knew it. They all knew it from the beginning. Anyway, that's a digression. Right. Wow. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. So Karl Marx, German philosopher, not yeah. uh, like su- pseudo economist. Economist guy. economy was not real. It was only starting like, to become created a school of social science. Econ- economics point, so. like helped create one of the founders of yeah, modern, modern economics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely an economist. So he's, so he's a economist a number one. He's the an economist the way that a dude in 1848 was a doctor when he was like leeching people and like cutting ankles off right. and shit. You know, like, like, he was suggesting like, he was, like, 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 that like, was a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. That's a doctor like in 1848. I, like, if I time traveled back to 1848, I'd be qualified you are a for any job literally <laughs> yeah. that came across oh, my yeah. desk. I was the fucking Lulu. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Just because I read the internet for, like, more than Dr. a minute. Dr. Jamie Cavanaugh, Esquire. <laughs> oh, <laughs> baby, I don't yeah. mind that. I don't mind. My mom loves that. I think that's the plot of, <laughs> I think that's the plot of Black Knight with Martin Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I was yeah. wondering when we would get to that seminal communist text. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> um, okay, so he's yeah, German uh, a philosopher, economist, came up with the, 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 this idea, and yeah. it took off in Russia, which he didn't foresee happening. Mm-hmm. Um, right. The now idea- Russia and China are quote unquote communist. Right. Right. Uh, uh, not anymore. Russia is not a communist country anymore. Okay. Uh, China. On in theory is in yeah. practice it's an oligarchy with a lot of capitalism. China has actually worked out worked themselves out the sweetest fucking deal in the world, where they have the absolute control that communism allows or that socialism allows, but also have the unlimited dynamic potential of capitalism. It does mean killing lots of people, yeah. but uh, they really have to get they've got that thing locked down. Yeah. Right. E- yeah. Economically, a lot of people talk about China working as a mercantilist economy rather than a free trade economy. So China's economics are more similar to something like 16th century Venice than they are to 20th century America. And that's not really, I think, being glib. Like, they set um, export tariffs, or import tariffs, but they don't set export tariffs. So China can export things really cheaply, but they don't allow people to import things. And they play around with their currency as a, at a state level in a way that can actively control how wealthy people in the country are. And and not just in the country. Like, they, they, they fuck with the destinies of all sorts of other countries based on how st- they, they will, like, de- depress or inflate their currency to build or sink other nations that they're in relation to. Ah. Like, they... Yeah, mercantile. Yeah. Wow. It's basically, like, a very small group of people using a billion other people as a huge gold Rolls Royce. Right. Like, that's what China is at this point. So, I, I guess the the... the, the the, the sort of point I'm trying to angle in on is who are the communists? Mm-hmm. Where are they? It, it, They're it, in it, fucking Kurdistan! <laughs> <laughs> there they are! <laughs> like, yeah, do, is, there a, is there a significant area uh, of land with a significant group of people that are actively being communists. According to all my family members, it's every single university. Yeah. yeah. And, also and downtown and Toronto. Yeah. Every CBC building. If you see someone on a bicycle, they're definitely a communist. They're doing a latte, they're a communist. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the obvious thing, we have talked about this also in our ISIS episode, in um, Rojava, in Syria, which is the Kurdish part of Syria, there is a fully con- like communist state. That's mm. probably that might be the like clearest one on yeah. earth right now. Yeah. Like that yeah. they're like we are communists and also like here's your house and have some food. You know, like that's right. what will happen if you show up in Rojava. Mm. Um that's a, that's the clearest communist state. There's places like Cuba that are like and Venezuela communist. Yeah, Venezuela. I heard and that issue. when 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 Greek when Greece was really like in the in the dumps, like at, the, at sort of the base of their barrel, that they had set up an economic economic system in which people 
um, had units of work and uh, whatever. So like if I'm a, if I'm a farmer and I farm, you know, 500 units of wheat, I can put those. I, I can trade you two units of wheat for two units of car repair or whatever. And I'm a car repair man, mm -hmm. and so I I need these two units of wheat. And now I can trade these two units of wheat to this person. So at the end of the day, you just write a write a bill for like this is who you need to send my units of wheat to, and this is who you need to send my units of Hmm. of uh, uh, clothes making or what, whatever it is. Like to. labor vouchers. Right? Yeah, 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 effectively, yeah. That was an idea that was tossed around in a lot of communist circles, and I think it was really briefly introduced in Russia at some points, but at some points in scarcity, but um, hmm. generally I think it's only been applied in uh, really small micro-states. Yeah, and, and like I said, it was, it was, uh, I remember reading about it when, it was, when Greece was like, in the, the heap of their shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It was sort of a last, you know, they're, they're not importing anything. They're not producing anything. They need right. to they just need to use, use, what they're, use what they're making. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the big things that is, um, one of the reasons that you don't see more um, communist or socialist countries in the world is quite literally because the Americans keep killing them. Uh, yeah. Um, that, like, on, like, untold occasions... Um, uh, popular leftist uprisings in, especially Latin America, Even but also in Africa. Not just uprisings, like elections. Elections, like straight up <laughs> like, democratic elections. Yeah. The Americans will just swoop in and kill them. Salvador like if, if a communist in Chile and things yeah, like right. this. That's the classic example. Um, the end, there yeah. are all sorts of countries where they where they had these where they're moving towards these social experiments, and then you move towards these social experiments, and then the dictate, and then the, 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 the and then the sometimes democratically elected leader of the country ends up dead, and the CIA was very busy at mm. that time. Right. Um, and so you don't see there aren't a lot of nations that are currently practicing um, uh, so like so structurally socialist countries but there's also uh, you know as Marx would say a historical materialist reason why hmm. there aren't a lot of countries that are practicing socialist or communist yeah. um, ideas huh. yeah. so when we talk about these cu countries like the USSR uh, and China degrading back into a capitalist society that's something that a lot of uh, theoretical communists will call revisionism where they will erase the past to try and return back to capitalism and mm -hmm. um, Joseph Stalin wrote a, a text called Socialism in One Country where after the USSR had expanded all the way into the Warsaw Pact, so that's uh, Poland Czechoslovakia at the time Hungary, uh, it had also gone into um, uh, Kazakhstan and a couple of countries in the Caucasus like Georgia and uh, modern day Chechnya, he wrote this text called socialism in one country which meant that we're finally big enough that socialism will stay around forever because we occupy so much of the world and so much of the world's population and we saw how that turned out right yeah. every other serious socialist text has said that there's one thing that capitalism is unfetteringly amazing at and that's in keeping capitalism going mm -hmm. even if it starts sinking even if people start dying in some portion of the world because of lack of access to goods capitalism will manage to destroy alternatives to itself and that's why most communists talk about global revolution and the need for permanent revolution and mm -hmm. socialism in every country. It needs to be a global program. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I wonder, uh, like, I, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a pretty idealist uh, fella, and I don't feel uh, out of sorts saying that amongst you three. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I, I wonder if, uh, you know, I, I, because uh, there are... Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are like socialist elements to our own systems. Like our healthcare system seems to me pretty like you know everybody pays in, everybody gets equal amount, non-discriminatory. What you're you're sick with, we like they'll treat. Mm -hmm. um, totally. Is that the way? Like you know, it it it, it seems far fetched to me mm -hmm. uh, to be like everybody in the world has to change their mind at once. Um, in order to succeed, or or is it more of a grudge, a creep, you know, of a we'll, we'll socialize, you know, the fire department and police, and we'll socialize the hospital system, and we'll socialize with the UBI, and uh, and so what you're like, talking about is, is a great question, and it's a very interesting question. Um, there's lots of like inc people th like even in Russia there were people who wanted incremental change and people who wanted revolution the people who wanted revolution are called were called the Bolsheviks you've probably heard of them yeah the people who wanted incremental change were called the Mensheviks and this is actually Lenin who named them and he named the Bolshevik Bolshevik in Russian just means like the majority and Mensheviks means minority yeah. <laughs> except the Mensheviks were actually like a numerical massive majority but he just like did this brilliant thing where he was like we are the majority people we want the revolution you minority 
majority of people don't get it. Um, Good public relations guy, yeah. guy that Lennon. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting... It's always been the question. The th- I mean, the thing is... Capitalism is very good at resisting all, any alternatives to it and absorbing any alternatives to it and at derailing any like honest chances to uh, to affect it. And I mean, the, the, the classic thing is that in our system, in Canada, in the US, um, the levers of power are massively controlled by capital, by people with a shitload of money who have a huge stake in continuing to be allowed to make a shitload of money and not have their money taken to like benefit everybody else like you know the simple question that you that that you said in our ubi episode which is like why isn't there a maximum wage you know people are pitching that um melanchon the guy who was like the bernie sanders in france yeah he pitched a 95 percent tax bracket after 400,000 euros so if you make 400 grand a year after that we're 95 percent taxing every dollar you make right which seems like not unfair on some level right it's like you have a shit you still be exorbitantly wealthy but like you know the 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 several thousand people who that affects are tend to be the people who are at Justin Trudeau's fundraiser. They're the people who are at who talk to the politicians mm-hmm. and who give those politicians money which they use to stay in power and that's a cycle that keeps capitalism alive and, and resists incremental change. The few times we've had massive social programs have uh, have been kind of like outliers. They've been exceptions and there's no evidence that things are gen- like things are quietly stepping towards a more social system and like our, in our lifetimes the world we live in is way less socialist than the one our parents lived in you know yeah. like our world is a lot more cutthroat and diehard and we've lost a lot of the social protections and stuff that they used to have and you look at like i come from the west as well right i come from saskatchewan we all that, come from the west all we're, four of us are all, canadian we're westerners, westerners. Yeah. we're not we're not these downtown like <laughs> toronto yeah, these yuppie communists we're Fixie real riding <laughs> we're real salt of the earth types here <laughs> that, uh, that explain it to jamie um, <laughs> so in this in, in western canada in saskatchewan we had a uh a, "Quote unquote socialist government with the CCF back in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s, mm-hmm. and they introduced the first medical care program in Canada that became our Medicare that we know and love today. But it's also in Saskatchewan that uh, my good buddy Bradley Wall, our current premier, is trying to reintroduce private health care back into the Canadian conversation, mm. and he's actually doing a pretty good job of it, and he's managed to tear down." Little bits of this wall about this great Canadian idea that this healthcare is a right. Wall. Uh, <laughs> <right>. Kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So like we're backsliding. Like the minimum. Like things about how like the minimum wage doesn't keep pace with with inflation anymore. Right. You know things like our labor regulations have eroded. Like mm-hmm. like unions are eroding. Things like that. These are all steps backwards into more unregulated capitalism because capitalists have succeeded at lobbying the government to get them the things that will make them more money at the expense of everybody's well-being that just keeps happening well to quote um uh ian malcolm from jurassic park (laughs) life will find a way yeah and to back that up i i wonder sometimes i uh you know, I, I think the the eighteen year old punk rock version of myself is like fucking let it burn. You know, uh, of like let uh, uh, if it takes getting further away from the ideal that I want to for everybody the masses to wake up, mm-hmm. is that actually progress? <laughs> you know, can't cancel me out. But like if if the you know the the wage gap gets so big that eventually sixty percent of the population cannot deny the fact mm-hmm. that 60% of the population is living at, at a far, far lower lower yep. uh, quality of life than, than the top four, or t- 10%, then isn't that actually a benefit? I mean, and that's what happened in Russia. Like, let's mm-hmm. go back there. In 1917 in Russia, the Tsar had committed Russia to World War One, which was, like, so unpopular. Bad. Like, bad. like World bad. War One was, you know, a fucking... Obviously, we you know a lot about it. Uh, it was a it was a fucking butcher show, right? Like it's like people were just getting fucking massacred, and people already were pissed at the Tsar, and there was a lot of unrest forming even before World War One started about how wealthy the elite of Russia was and how poor the peasants were. They were still like 
peasants in Russia at this time. It was still feudal, right? It hadn't industrialized, like the guys said. So it was those conditions. It was like every single person in the country knew somebody who had been shipped off to the war and was getting fucking killed. And, and there was no food because of the war. And there were all these rich people driving around in their fucking carriages. That was the conditions in which revolution finally happened. And it's worth saying, the first revolution in, in Russia was not a communist revolution. It was like a, it just a, like a military coup, basically, right. um, to kick the Tsar out because he had overcommitted to World War I and was so removed from the people that he was just basically going to destroy his whole country mm. for the sake of being in this European war. And it was only once the February question mark revolution, that was the first one? The February, was the the first February one. revolution in 1917 happened that the communists, who had been trying for decades to start a revolution, they saw it happening. A lot of them weren't even in, like Lenin had fled to Germany by that point. He was hiding because he was, you know, like a wanted criminal in Russia. They Lenin cut a deal with the people who took over, like in the mean in the midpoint, to come back to Russia after they revolted, and then the communists took over a couple months later in the October Revolution. That was the real communist revolution. Mm -hmm. So it was only once everything was all they fucked to come already. Up with more creative names for the revolution. <laughs> yeah. Say that yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, well, what day is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Revolutionaries okay. like scientists are bad at naming things. Right? Like, oh, man. Have you ever heard of the like French revolutionary calendar? No. So oh, it's French. Great. So one of the like crazier things that they tried to do after the French calendar was like they tried to do um, the metric system for like the calendar. So, you know, the calendar is not named after Norse gods. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but also like not having a totally random number of days. Like yeah, yeah, right. every month was like 10. Everything was tens. Yeah. It was metric, right? So it was like every month had 30 days and every week had 10 days. Right. And every single day was named in the whole year. So like it was like this day is plow day. It was all named non secular stuff, right? It was right. all named after like farm shit and like and stuff like of trees, the yeah. but yeah. also like had corresponding to the seasons. Yeah, it was like Thermidor was like the May summer. No, it was like the summer. It was August? hot. It's yeah. like July was Thermidor. Right. But then it was and it was like Plumaire was like was like April because it was rainy. You know, like shit right. like that. Um, oh, I like. Okay, well, let's take a little break from the from all this yeah. talk. I like this kind of conversation. <laughs> yeah. The Aztecs. Uh, one of the reasons they were so good at math is they counted to twenty on each uh, on each or, or ten on each hand because yeah. they counted their or they counted their knuckles as well. Was it twelve? Was it each? One, two, digit, three, one, two, three, two, three, four. three, four. Yeah, I think so. Something yeah, like that. A base twelve math system. Yeah, yeah. And so they're like, uh, that, and that's one of the reasons they had, they were so f far beyond uh, other other feudal uh, nations. See, I just thought it was a racist stereotype that all Aztecs are good at math and are terrible drivers. But no, <laughs> <laughs> no. or like keyboards. Yeah. Keyboard, keyboards are designed to slow you down while you type. Yeah. Really? They're the most ineffective way to type. They're designed to slow down because we learn to type on typewriters. And typewriters have those those little metal things shooting at the page all right. the time. And so if you're too good, they get stuck. And so they're actually designed to be an ineffective way to type, yeah. which is why stenographers use a different keyboard. But now they're just... Just like you, you can't yeah, reteach the entire world how to use the new the the, uh, the new better keyboard. Honestly, though, yeah. but I um, I'm amazing, <laughs> and I I went to, you know I lived in a foreign country for a year where they have a different keyboard. As we're to you. Yeah, it's like a different. It's like everything's in a different place, uh -huh. and it was deeply traumatizing to start using it. But in the end, you I actually could use the keyboard, not as fast as the QWERTY keyboard, but I could use it. Yeah, um, I forget what it's called. There is the the most effective keyboard in the world. Couples all the vowels together. Dvorak and, uh, or Dvorak? Or Dvorak or yeah, yeah, that's right. Like that. That's right. Dvor yeah, Dvorak. Dvorak is a composer. Yeah. No, Dvorak but is a composer. Dvorak maybe is the keyboard. I believe you. <laughs> Circling this all the way Double back yeah. <laughs> to socialism, yes, um, yes, is that I think to me these this is this is why I'm like a, a, a pretty outspoken anti-capitalist is because something like a better use of a keyboard, capitalism is never going to come up with because mm -hmm. there's no pro practical benefit in everyone in everyone like being able to type 
better. No, sorry, capitalism will come up with it when 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 it benefits capitalism. Right. But there are so many things in our That's, lives that, that are good and healthy and essential that capitalism cannot monetize, and so right. it has no interest in. Before we jump too far from that, I want to incorporate uh, reincorporate the uh, uh, Charles Dickens yeah. uh, thing you said earlier, um, uh, which is do you like it just. As an extra, do you know why his his books are so wordy and so long? <laughs> Were they serial? Was he, he paid by the he word? He paid, paid by, by the yeah, word. <laughs> he wrote in serial for newspapers. So right. like, yeah. So he would draw those babies out as yeah, long yeah. as he could. He didn't How know long can I talk contract. about this misery? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Totally. And then there therein is another like capitalism does not necessarily make you the best story. Right. It makes you a, a no. very very long story. No. With thousands of characters called Mrs. Wimblebottom and. I, and and that, the like. That's like the problem with <laughs> capitalism. Like, it it is a totally amoral belief system. It is a belief system, but its only values are growth and profit, right? If something is profitable and if you can grow it, it deserves to exist under capitalism. And that means we get the dumbest shit in the world sometimes, right? And you get all this crazy, all these resources used on things that don't matter. Used on things that, like the juicero. <laughs> you know, it's the classic example, which is this Silicon Valley $400 juicer that cold presses juice for you in a proprietary bag of fruits and vegetables. So like, you can't just buy fruit and put it in this fucking juicer. You have to buy their bag of fruit and put it in the juicer. But also... They figured out that you can just squish the bag of juice with your hands and the juice comes out. You don't need the juicer at all, right? So, like, this is like these millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of venture funding went into this fucking company. Right. And well, in earlier and we were talking about Lyft and Uber. You have two companies who are actively competing with each other, trying to do almost the same thing. Right. right. And the theory is that the, that competition will produce the best solution right for everybody that's the good of capitalism is because there's competition somebody's going to figure out the best way and that way is going to win and then we'll have this great solution but we've seen like with um, all the focus on United Airlines the airlines just divided America in four parts the four major airlines each of them took a part and none of them compete anymore right, and they yeah. just fucking laugh at our misery drink mugs full of our tears so and live on a private island like in Oligarchy? Monopoly? Oligarchy. Yeah, I believe it's called an oligopoly. Fucking killing it. Killing it. Yeah. Since 1988. Which Hope. leads me to another question. I've wonder, I've often wondered why, like, once a company reaches that level, like an oligopoly, as you just said, mm -hmm. why doesn't it then <laughs> become public? Um, you know, right. like, like for a company like the Alphabet Corporation that just, that just... Uh, is never going to crumble. You yeah. know, it's the it's the Rome that will never burn mm -hmm. because it, it 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 owns so much stuff. Why doesn't that? You know, why doesn't the government? And I understand it being impossibly expensive. And then you you know I. It, it's not why if guillotine, guillotines are involved? Yeah. <laughs> but why why doesn't it just become public? If we go okay, we won the game. Uh, yeah. You know, we won the game on airlines, yeah. and you, it's not moving. Delay of game penalty. This belongs to the the government. I, I'm sure the the actual reason is that the people who are making the money pay the people who make the decisions to let them keep making money. And I would that's say that's like, got to be it. To expand right. upon like uh, this, this is a thought that Richard brought, Richard brought up earlier, which is like it's not only like fundraisers and backroom deals and like you know bags of cash slid under doors that allow capitalism to continue to be like continue to enforce its will on major governing bodies. Hmm. It's also the fact that um, massive corporations control almost all of the media. So almost all of the information that people receive comes through the lens of people who want capitalism to continue. Right. Like, because, uh, cap because everything is owned, every force that is exerted can be exerted in favor of capitalism. Right, right. right. And, and so the great example of that is you look at Great Britain, private companies built all the railroads, and after the English government saw how much of a function the railroads provided for the country, they just bought them all and nationalized them. And they ran them perfectly, and everyone liked the railroads pretty much. And then when Margaret Thatcher came in, she was a capitalist ideologue and said, these should be private. And she privatized them. And then all of a sudden they were... all, all It was an oligarchy. Uh, it was an oligopoly again. Mm -hmm. So everyone owns their little slice of railroad, and now the railroads in England are terrible. And okay. so the Labour Party, who's the quote-unquote socialist party in England 
talks about, well, let's just nationalize them again. They should just be nationally publicly owned. Huh. And we have a microcosm of that in Canada with um, CN Rail. That was privatized. And uh, we have... Um, yeah, Bill, doesn't uh, Bill Gates yeah, own C- most of uh, CP? Is it CP? Yeah. I think so. I think he does. Actually. I yeah, would believe that. Is that, is that, is that a joke? That's not no, a joke. I don't think no, it's a I joke. Think Bill that's Gates a, owns most of one of the Canadian rail companies? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh In fact, actually, here's a fun anecdote. I took I had to take the train from Edmonton to Toronto because I had just had surgery and I wasn't able to fly, but I had to be back in Toronto. And it, it, it's By one the of way, those. Your cybernetic eye is really it's it looks really great good. tonight. Yeah. So good. <laughs> That's a good it's so cybernetic good. eye. You're not just man. saying that. No. Okay. I've, I've been thinking it for a long time. I've been I, wondering if it, I should say. I it. did bring <laughs> this story up only for compliments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but what you know, the train ride. Which if you you at home are thinking about taking it, I would advise maybe don't. It's like yeah. uh, painful. I had just had surgery on my face, but also, and I didn't have a sleeping car, but also it was a long time and no Wi-Fi and. Anyway, but but every time the train like so the train is is driving and the train has the capacity to drive at like a hundred eighty kilometers an hour let's say yeah um, but because freight trains use the same um, same way and they max out at fifty kilometers an hour and the passenger train is renting space from the CP it's not actually you know it, it Bill Gates doesn't give a shit about. Uh, whether you, I get across in a timely fashion or not, you always have to pull off to the side right. and let freight trains go by, and there's no point going faster because you're always going to catch a freight train. Right. Yeah. So, so Fun I do, fact. I do the. Do we want to make this a whole podcast about trains? Yeah. Because if not, I can cut this in. Yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, <laughs> I do the commute between Montreal and Toronto a lot, and the reason behind that is that uh, Via Rail and I guess it was Canadian Pacific were both owned by the same company. Hmm. They were both owned by the Canadian government, and I think it was Brian Mulroney's government wanted to sell them to try and buff up the budget a little bit because they were running kind of structural deficits at that point, and they offered both of them up for sale and all of the private companies said well passenger rail is never going to make a profit so you guys can keep that but we'll buy up all the railroad and all the freight and that just kind of shows that capitalism has no interest in the public good right no. we were using freight to subsidize passenger rail because passenger rail was seen as a public good and freight was seen as a productive good mm. but capitalism only wants production it does not want public good mm. here's here's a Here's an analogy that I independently came up with, although I know that it's probably been come up with before, and I don't claim to be the first person to think this up. Capitalism, to me, uh, it's like fire. Like, its place in the development of human history is undeniable, and its power is undeniable. But you do not want everything to be on fire, even if fire is a good (laughs) thing in certain situations, (laughs) Right. right? And you want... Like you need fires to be controlled, and you need the ability to put them out, and you do not need them to. You do not want fires to be able to replicate themselves on on unbidden, with like uncontrollably. Right. And capitalism, I think, is the same way. Like the the power of competition in a market on a on a small term is unbelievable. And I I, I believe in organicity. I believe in spontaneous people trying to find the correct solution to a problem that society has and competing to find the best solution and finding the best solution but then i believe in snuffing the co- like snuffing the capitalism out in some way you right. know like putting it out once this like you said you won you're public now yeah like we need that mechanism but we don't have it at all right right and okay like, we, 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 so um I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no. I'm wondering, because this is very quickly becoming not a communist podcast, but a anti-capitalist. But the thing about and, it is, at, at the moment, communism is really the only clear alternative to capitalism that we have. Great, right? which like, leads me to my question: right. is I don't, I don't necessarily want to get away from that because I'm enjoying this, mm-hmm. but I think I wonder if not capitalism, we we clearly in the in the room agree that commun their the communist values are an asset. What is there anything else on in that swing that uh, that that is an alternative, or or is it capitalism or communism as far as like this room anarchy? is concerned? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other thing. But Anthony Anthony has a great line, which is not his, but it reminds me of him, which is that social democracy is is literally the left wing of fascism. Um, social democracy is the left wing of fascism. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you haven't really I need talked you to, about social yeah. democracy. Yeah. I need you to delve into that a little bit. I don't know I, what you're talking about. I can jump into this a little bit. Great. Um, so if we're looking at that early question about uh, do we want 
revolution or we don't do we want incrementalism uh the great schism in communism was generally that kind of sidetracking for a second marx was as we talked about a philosopher he didn't lay out a road map no, to how to build yeah. communism and the great two great philosophers of communism or socialism were vladimir lenin who we've talked about who was a revolutionary and a guy named karl kautsky who was a german social democrat and karl kautsky talked about how if you just implemented socialist ideas into a capitalist system they would be so well loved and so respected by the public and so essential to the functioning of a good society that they would just slowly eliminate capitalism and that was replicated in england in what was called the fabian society which is where uh, labor grew out of right the labor governments in england who instituted the national health service and instituted all this nationalization of industry and labor standards across basically they were replicated across the entire world it was the greatest um growing of public good in, in human history was mm. in labor governments and in uh, scandinavian governments and in german governments um and this was the schism so social democracy was this idea espoused, where you take these uh, socialist ideas of public good inserted into an economic system, and they become so essential that they slowly transform it into something else. Um, and that's what the NDP is here. They are a social democratic party, uh, and there's a lot of social democrats across the entire world. A lot of communist philosophers like uh, Leon Trotsky, a famous uh, communist in Russia. He was the head of the Red Army during the revolution and then he was second in line basically behind Lenin to be the leader of the USSR before he was usurped by the bureaucracy in Stalin. He said that social democracy, this idea that you can just make a kinder capitalism that will slowly evolve into something good, was just a left wing of fascism. It was just a way to suppress communists because communists were acting and asking for a greater better world mm -hmm. and social democrats were saying may you please give us a better world and it will just which is what cut off the revolutionary tide of the people mm -hmm. which is what we have now like mm -hmm. in canada there's not a lot of political will huh. for revolution against capitalism because people have so much material comfort and they understand on some level that their material comfort is due to capitalism right so like you know on some level your clothes are being made by people who are paid nothing in Bangladesh whose factories collapse on them and they die in the hundreds. You know on some level that the fact that your bananas are grown in South America and the like, you know, the a massive amount of fuel and resources needed to bring you bananas into your supermarket is like kind of a waste of resources to get you this one tropical fruit in the middle of winter in Canada. It's, you know, like you understand these things and yet you're hesitant to act on them. All of us feel this in the West and that's the mechanism, exactly the thing that Anthony just talked about. Right? Well, and, and, and actually, and I, I heard a story of uh, uh, there's this chef, celebrity chef who went to some small village in South America and was and was getting uh, he was there to get sort of tips on local cuisine and stuff like that. And he brought them food from from where he was and you know and they 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 came to love it that this like uh, I forget what it was, I think it was candy or mm -hmm. or something and he w was walking around their village one day and he found wrappers all over the ground and like in the bush mm -hmm. and and he was like picking them up being like no no you can't do this you know you can't you can't put it on the ground um, and like why would you do this and he realized in that moment that the only reason that it had happened in the first place was because he had brought it in the first place so the idea that they're throwing it on the ground and i think that sometimes when i see people littering on the street is you know yes it's it's disrespectful and it's irresponsible but ultimately ultimately we have to assume that if you're creating this this garbage that some of it's going to end up on the ground so the fact that it's being created in the first place is the is the amora immorality but even if Tim Hortons puts don't don't litter on the don't cups, litter on the cup people still people litter. Still litter it's crazy yeah. and Tim Hortons has no cap has no um, in impetus to create a biodegradable cup right yeah. like they exactly. don't it's not profitable exactly and here exactly. we are again right? so it's easy to blame the people who are throwing the garbage on the ground versus the people that are creating massive amounts of yeah. uh, non-biodegradable here's here's garbage. an interesting point i want to make too. so antony very very well defined social democrat just then but another term you hear is democratic socialism and they're different things even though they're the same two fucking words on in different orders english okay. yeah, um so democratic socialism is a newer idea 
a newer compared to like the Russian Revolution. Um, and again, so uh, rolling back to what Anthony said, Marx didn't leave a roadmap to communism, and that's part of that's basically the problem. All the bad shit you hear about communism came because the roadmap's not clear. One of the things that Marx did say is he said the middle step between capitalism and the utopian communism is there needs to be a dictatorship of the proletariat. That's the exact words he used. In which the proletariat, the working class, the farmers, the people who work in the factories, the people who do the work need to rise up, uh, revolt against the people who own all the shit, and then control society right. as a dictatorship. He was like, there needs to be a the people who are the laborers need to control society as a dictatorship in order for us to create the mechanisms that will lead to communism. Now, is that or is that not what Bain tried to set up <laughs> yes. in the Dark Knight? Oh, crisis? I was so fucking angry in the third Dark Knight movie. I was so fucking angry. <laughs> fucking Christopher Nolan is like, oh, this is what society needs. The big fucking fascist dickhead who just punches his way through all of the problems. Anytime all of the people get together and decide that they want their lives different that's a problem because the masses are inherently evil yeah. fuck that movie fuck Christopher yeah. Nolan what well <laughs> I was born in the Russian Revolution <laughs> <laughs> you merely googled it <laughs> Uh, yeah, no. Oh, so oh, good. I'm so gonna use the Bane voice in this episode. Yeah, and we I had, was wondering what would break first. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had talked about this though on one of our double dips. The reason Russia became a totalitarian dictatorship, the reason China became a totalitarian dictatorship, is because that's what they thought the plan was. Right. They wanted to create a better society, but then it turns out once you create the mechanisms of a dictatorship, one asshole can ruin it for everybody. That's what Stalin huh. did in Russia, and what Mao himself, the guy who architected it all in in China, did in China, right? Like Stalin was a a minor figure in the Russian Revolution. He was one of the you know leaders, but he like robbed banks to help the revolutionaries get money. Right. And he was not considered as smart or cool or talented as Trotsky and Lenin. Um, but he was kind of he thought he was the best one, and he displaced and murdered them all. Right. Like that that's kind of what ended up happening. That's I was I was reading this uh and it's a short <laughs> story anyway long long story short this guy meets God and God uh, over the period of this long conversation uh reveals that the only that uh the point at which hum humanity uh will be able to ascend to a higher level is mm -hmm. when uh you have reached the security that you can put the the world ending detonator into the hand of each and every human being and each and every human being refuses to press the button right and uh i thought that was uh fucking interesting and, and it's also frustrating because you, you thinking about now you're like there's no way in hell i would put that detonator in every human being's hand no. at this per at this moment that shows how far we have to go uh, yeah I'm, we read 4chan and now we yeah. like now, we, <laughs> now we're like hell the fuck yeah. out. bury oh, that to detonator get, to, to get a bit poly side for a second that's the entire idea of what's called democratic peace theory or or mutually assured destruction in democratic peace theory mm -hmm. where everyone does have the detonator or at least enough people have a detonator and mm, that no they've one's chosen not to press them but yeah. we're, we're seeing right now in the world there are two people who may have a detonator and they may be really close to pressing them right, especially right. one dude who like gets all of his shit from whatever is on Fox and Friends or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like, and especially a guy whose entire house is made of gold right. yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, I think shit. both of their houses yeah. are entirely yeah. made yeah. of gold I was going to say are we talking about Donald Cheese Whiz Trump or Kim <laughs> Cheese Whiz John Un I believe is the kind of two dudes we're talking about um, no but I, what I was trying to do is define democratic socialism so right. Marx had this idea that you needed to have a dictatorship. Mm. But since we've seen what happened in Russia, what happened in China, socialists in the modern era have adopted this thing, democratic socialism, which is like, let's use the mechanisms of democracy, but have a socialist ideology. So like our the vision anymore isn't that we have a dictatorship and like murder squads and shit like that. But it's that you use the, the institutional mechanisms of a democracy 
inside the like kind of revolutionary aspects of emancipating uh, capital like uh, emancipating the means of production from capital like taking away people owning factories and shit like that you everyone owns everything but then also you still elect your leaders there is still right. democratic accountability it tastes like mom's home cooking but it's actually broccoli and uh, vegan food exactly yeah, right. <laughs> you can't become a billionaire anymore but you can still elect who leads you and that person has to step down like that's the new vision of the right. middle step. And right? there's even an argument that, like, you can't really have democracy under capitalism um, because so long as people's material conditions are sort of their most pressing concern, where it's like, if I don't uh, work, I don't eat, I die. If I don't work, I, you know, not in this country, don't have health care, I die. Mm -hmm. Like, that you can't, you can't sort of, like, become a... a um, a meaningful civic participant where you're like I think this right. is what should happen because free will you're too busy becomes being like, polluted exactly like, you're yeah. like oh I should do we should do this because this will lead to me maybe having a job oh my god can I please have a job you right. look at the United States only 52 55 percent of people vote the the 48 45 percent of people who don't vote universally make under thirty thousand dollars a year right? right so it's not a democracy it's a democracy for people in the lower middle class slash middle class and up right yeah. and rich people overwhelmingly vote and they overwhelmingly influence elections so that's right. this idea that there's no democracy without socialism actually the democracy we have now is a half stage yeah, because in socialism you free people from the need to work to live the fact that you have to work to live is a form of coercion and slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Like like in our society, the fact that you have to go work for somebody in order to live, that's the way capitalism compels you to participate in it, right? But if you had, you know, the state providing you food and the state providing you a place to live, suddenly you're emancipated from all of that. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. you don't need to work to live anymore. And, and that suddenly frees you up to do all kinds of other things. We don't know what that society looks like. Right. That society's never existed. Can I just get in with a hot, sexy idea for a yeah, second? Get oh, in there. Yeah, so always I'm, feel free. I know that, Jamie, you were talking earlier about this idea of people getting stock options, mm. and we were talking about democratic socialism. And earlier I talked about um, the Scandinavian countries and social democracy. Well, one of the great philosophers and economists in Scandinavia, in Sweden, I believe it was, was a guy named uh, Rudolf Meidner, who was the, uh, he was the finance minister in Sweden for about 10 or 12 years in um, the 60s and 70s. And Rudolf Meidner came up with this idea called the Meidner Plan, wherein every job that was worked would receive a portion of the stock of the company every year. So you'd get your wage... And you'd also get a share of the profits. And basically, Sweden has like a 70 or at this point, I think 85, 90 percent unionization rate. So everyone's a union member. Hmm. So all the unions started collecting all the companies. And his idea was that over about 20 years, eventually the business owners who were these you know, you know, entrepreneurs who had ideas and they were like, I see a market opening. I, I want to open a business. They got to open a business. And if that business started doing really, really well and hiring a lot of people, eventually the union would just take it over rather than someone's kid taking it over. Right. And right. so eventually the country would be composed of a whole bunch of unions running a bunch of good businesses. And the government would work with the unions to supply a good life for everyone in the country. And that was a wildly radical plan that was so cool and basically built Sweden and what it is today in a much truncated version. Mm -hmm. they, they, they obviously eliminated the 100% unionization over 20 years and things yeah. like this, but... There's yeah. so many things to get kind of like excited about. You know, when you start really, when you start opening your mind to a system outside of a capitalist system, like think of a system, like we talked about the Alaska Permanent Fund and our UBI, which is a big, every company that did oil extraction in Alaska had to pay a certain of money, uh, amount of money into a big fund that's managed like a mutual fund. And if that fund makes interest, they just take the interest and give a, a, a proportion of it to every person who lives in Alaska. But like, think of if like the GDP of Ontario worked that way. Yeah. Think of it like if Ontario makes money this year, everyone splits it. Yeah. Like the government gives you enough money for a house and for food, but then like if we as a huge collective make money, we split it. Like, and that is like, it's not quite, it is communism in the sense that everyone owns the means of production, but there's like a capitalist element in there. There's like a market element. There's a competitiveness element. There's an element of wealth, which is like, you know, and we haven't really even delved into that. We should probably start wrapping up, so we probably won't delve into it, but like, it's, it's a much more communist world. Like, and then there's something to be excited about that. Well, like, I was going to say, it's like that, um, <clears throat> um, oh 
oh shit, what's the, what's the name of the author? The the capitalist realism. Yeah, book. yeah, about the K-punk. I, Mark K-punk. Fisher. K punk. Yeah. Mark Fisher. The fella uh, in this book. The what I the big thing I took from it, which is also like the main first thing, is the idea that we can't imagine a world a a, a better system than capitalism. So we refuse to acknowledge that a world like that could exist mm-hmm. is that you know the the yeah we we we've fixed this thing you know it, it's the old argument it's the best system we have so we don't why, why you know until we find a better one wasn't it winston churchill it. who said capitalism democracy is the worst yeah. Yeah, system he's a real ever yeah he said, <laughs> democracy is the worst system ever invented except for all of the other systems that have ever been invented yeah. or some horrible paraphrase like that yeah and capitalism can but uh, capitalism is key, yeah, you know? yeah and 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 it but it it is that denial. It is that like imprisonment of I can't imagine something better, or I can't imagine it working, or you know the the idea that the whole world has to change all at once, um, or or nothing, or it will never change at all. Like that sort of like futile yeah. look at a, a mass system change. Well- and and reluctance to to uh, to accept that as what's funny is that history completely invalidates that opinion and oh and it has any any historical event like in 1863 it was insane that Canada would confederate into one country all of the provinces of British North America there was that was not at all a mainstream political idea in 1863 but in 1864 boom. Right. All of a sudden, that deal was getting written down. Yeah. You know, it took three more years. But if, like, if we're going to talk about uh, potentially misattributed quotes, like yeah. that, <laughs> yeah. that, that yeah. great Winston Churchill one, there's a great Vladimir Lenin quote that is: um, "There are decades where nothing <laughs> happens, and there are weeks where decades happen." Uh, and his idea was that the revolution, the Russian Revolution, happened in two days. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that changed the entire course of the world. For yeah. Mm-hmm. Potentially the rest totally. of time, or at least the rest of the next couple centuries. Right? And as Karl Marx says in the Communist Manifesto, you better lose yourself in the music the <laughs> moment, moment you, you want it. You better, better never let, let it go. go. Oh, they got one shot. Do, do not, not miss your chance, chance to go. Bro. This, this opportunity comes once in a lifetime. You better. <laughs> Uh, guys, oh. I you know what? I'm, I'm filled with joy because usually this podcast ends with me wanting to know less. <laughs> and this uh, has ended with me wanting to know more. I feel inspired. I feel invigorated. Um, a bit like the odds are set against me and what I want. Not yeah. that I, you know, I, I, I don't know that I'm, uh, I, I, I can like confidently say, I'm a communist. Uh, I, I am inspired by the sort of anti-capitalistic uh, and more idealistic uh, and socialist ways of looking at uh, looking at the world I live in. Um, That's sweet, man. But yeah, like where we're at, communism just shouldn't be a dirty word anymore. We're not fighting communism anymore. Like, that's not a part of our worldview in our modern time. But the thing that is happening is that capitalism is causing the the climate crisis, right? Like, it's capitalism. We could have every all our shit electric and we could be not using oil at all, but oil companies have fought to stay alive. You know, like, it, we could have transitioned to an all-electric economy. Electric cars and oil-based cars were created at the same time, but electric cars were killed by oil companies because oil companies got there faster. But electric cars could have had hundreds of years, like a hundred years of development by now. You know, they could be incredible. Right. And they yeah. are, they're the ones that are finally are starting to exist are there. But anyway, but can you make electric cow farts? <laughs> Let me tell that joke again. Yes. But can you make electric cow farts? You can, but it's horrifying. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to leave it at just, you, you can, <laughs> but... Oh, that End was that. Sentence. You ever see one of those like um, those things they have in like science centers? It's like a glass ball full of like purple lightning. Yeah, that's boy, what an electric. Car- that's an electric cow fart. Actually, yeah, yeah. that's what. I, that's and, what I- and the organic cow farm industry shut that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those fuckers. Oh, guys, oh. I th- I think it's time. I think it's time. You, I think it's time. We gotta while. call it. This has been one of my favorite episodes so far. I look forward to listening to it yeah. and sharing it. If you like this episode, please share it on your on your please various share, yeah. f- f- <laughs> things. Share it feely. Don't profit from it. Share it with those who need it only. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Take 
divide it, take an, take an audio editor, divide it into equal chunks, and give a certain chunk of it to all of your family. Yeah, and, <laughs> and actually, in listening to this, it belongs to you just as much as it belongs to us. That's right. So share it on Facebook, Twitter. We want more people to join in this conversation. We're having a great time making this podcast. Yeah, any feedback, email us, explain to Jamie at gmail.com. Twitter, at explain Jamie. Facebook, explain it to Jamie. I want to give a, a big... Insta- Twitter, yeah. at Real Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a huge thank you to our, our, our two guests and also, uh, yeah. uh, like, huge, already Possibly vi- the, vital yeah. parts the two, of the ecosystem of our uh, They're the two, podcast. like, they're the, the unsung hosts of the podcast, really. They've been such a huge part of us making this podcast. We're thrilled to finally have their voices on the air. So yeah. thank you guys for being here. Yeah, Anthony and Thomas amazing yeah. and uh I don't know where can we find you guys do you have Twitter so do you have things that people want you to, do you want people to look at uh I'm on Twitter at, at postbrechtium um it's <laughs> mostly politics and nonsense yeah, uh, and I want to go back to the beginning of the podcast. You don't know my name. I don't exist. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm doing the show with two improv guys, and the first thing I said on this podcast was no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you said no while also saying yes. And with your eyes. My God, those charming your, green, your green, 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 green eyes. Emerald green <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, the guys. Podcast. Thank you for listening. You at home. Um, stay vigilant. Stay active. Stay connected. Share. And we'll see you next time. Yeah.